we pray that as others sat on the mountainside and listened to you, that you would be no less present for us to be our teacher here and now and in our walk of life. That we truly might receive what you have given and live it. In your name we pray. Amen. If you don't know what it is, it's useless. If you don't know what it's for or what you're supposed to do with it. If you had this tool in your tool bag, it probably wouldn't get much use. But that's not to say you wouldn't use it at all. No, if you didn't have a hammer real handy and you needed a beat on something and, and it was right there, you'd, you might just be tempted to pick it up and use it anyway, right? Of course, there is a danger of using tools uh, not according to their specifications and, and the way they were meant to be used. If you use a tool the wrong way, there's a good chance you can hurt yourself and anyone else around you. Well, in Matthew chapter 4 and 5, there's a section in there called the Beatitudes. And I'm just assuming that most people really don't have a good understanding of what Beatitudes means, or even the word Beatitude. Is it is it like, well, this should be your attitude? Well, I googled it. And come to find out, the word Beatitude is Latin for happiness. Jesus was using these words to begin a rather long talk on the very happy and blessed life of actually being in his kingdom and being with him. And so what, a, what an amazing missed opportunity if one of the most detailed and comprehensive talks of Jesus is not understood readily by those who follow him. If the basic message that he has to share is not understood and is even baffling to those who are his disciples. It's useless then. And it isn't a big stretch then to think that and there are occasions then that we would use this tool of the Beatitudes uh, not according to specifications and in the wrong way. And it's not a big surprise then that we hurt ourselves and those around us with these words. And so as, as we think about the Beatitudes, this happy, blessed life of the kingdom, it would behoove us then to know exactly what it means, right? If we're going to use this. And, and then, since this isn't the first time that we've heard these words, we really need to start with what's already up here and, and in our understanding. Because most of us already have some idea that this is, this is kind of a list of people who, all things considered, you know, they're the ones who, who got it right. You know, the, they're the blessed, the happy, the, the ones who, who made it. You know, and if that's your understanding of the Beatitudes, then it just, like the moral of the story would be to be like them. Or at least admit that they, you know, they're on the right track and that the rest of them aren't. And that perhaps there's still time for you to repent and join them at the end of the line where they are. Well, if we use the Beatitudes in this way as, as a tool to you really prescribe how the good and blessed life of the kingdom is to be lived there is a major chance then that we will hurt ourselves. I mean, just think about it. Just pure logic. The poor in spirit, like, who are they? If you have a spiritual poverty, that means you have no spiritual resources available to you. Spiritual resources like faith. You, you just don't know what to believe. There's all these religions... Everybody says something contradictory about another person's religion. How are we even supposed to know? The spiritually poor do not have a basic reference of what is true and how the world actually works according to God. 
They have no biblical knowledge. They're in a Bible class and you ask them a question like, I don't know. Don't ask them to pray. They haven't been praying. They'll never show up at a worship service. They, this in no way is meant to be a, a goal of life to shoot for, to be like the, the spiritually poor. It will not lead to happiness or the good life in the kingdom. In fact, all of the people mentioned in these various categories, why, why even bring them up if they're not something to shoot for? Well, if you're somebody in one of these categories, say the spiritual poverty, well then you know just how truly awful and bankrupt it is and, and you wish life were different. You wish you did have a a reference of God that was believable and understandable, that you had all these biblical references to draw from in your life to make sense of life, and that you, you had someone to pray to. But see, now, Jesus mentions them specifically. These unblessable people are now blessed as he's come to be with them. And he says of them, even them, that you now are in. You're part of the honor roll of humanity because now you can have a happy life with God. You can have a blessed life as you're with me. They're in and they get it. And the it isn't the affirmation that they were right all along, that you should have been like them anyway. No, the it that they get is the kingdom of God. And, and the kingdom life of God is a very concrete reality. It's not like, you know, the kingdom. No, it, it, it's a concrete change in the here and now in the recipient of this gift and blessedness. And that's the reason I included some of the verses we heard last week from chapter 4. You know, like the blind, now they've entered the kingdom of God and they see. The lame, couldn't walk before, but now here and now they are able to walk. And, and the demon possessed, they're liberated. And so the, the spiritually poor, they have received spiritual riches because they now know who God really is as they've come to know Jesus and now they have a biblical working knowledge to know well, all these stories from the Bible, they all center around Jesus. And, and there is a new growing desire with them to continue a conversation with Jesus in their prayer and in their worship and in their study. They are truly blessed and have a happy life. But then the same goes for the rest of the list. Like, well, those who mourn aren't blessed because they're in the grip of, of grief. Those who are truly mourning, they know just how unblessable that season of life is. And the rest of us aren't called to join with them in their sorrows. <coughs> but the point is that even they, in the devastation of their heart, find a happiness and a blessedness now that their lives are with Jesus. For we certainly mourn and we certainly grieve, but not like the rest of the world. Not now that Jesus is with us because he comforts us with a true comfort that anything lost here in this world, well, he's coming again with a new heaven and a new earth. And we will live with him in the no tears place where death and dying and disease and pain, all the old order has passed away and that we are with God never again to grieve. And so this time now of sadness is but a brief passing moment hardly worth comparing to the glorious riches, St. Paul says, of what is to come. Yes, we grieve, but we are filled with hope. And then the meek, oh boy, the meek are definitely not, but they're the rat upon, spat upon, uh, the, yet even they, they have found a happy and blessed life with Jesus. Because they find themselves as they are with him in an unshakable kingdom. Jesus is their rock and their fortress. 
Though others will come in and take their things, a day is coming when they will inherit the earth and no one will take anything from them again. For these first three categories of people, it does seem to, to work pretty well to use the, the Beatitudes as this tool of, of the blesses, not, not as a status, but people that have encountered Jesus and now because of that, they're blessed. But you know, it, I don't know, does it work for the rest of them? Because aren't we supposed to pursue and be thirsty and hungry for righteousness, right? Shouldn't we pursue a pure heart? And shouldn't we try and make peace among people? Well, you'll find that this tool will never work to bang out a righteousness of your own that, and somehow God should just recognize you for having gotten something right. In fact, you'll find that even these categories are truly unblessable people until Jesus has come and blessed them. Like those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're not righteous. That's why they're hunger and thirsting for it. In fact, they're some of the most miserable people on the earth because nothing's ever right for them, not even themselves. They're the ones, no matter who's in charge of the government, oh, they're doing stupid things in their opinion. And, and they're the ones who are always sending food back to the restaurant kitchen because, well, it just wasn't cooked right. They're the ones who are at the meetings just fussing about this and that. Well, that's not right. Who made that decision? They're loud and obnoxious. There's no way they're ever going to have a happy life with themselves or anyone else until Jesus and what they've hungered for all of their lives and they've thirsted for what is truly right and good, they have found it. As Jesus fills them what they have so longed for. And, the, you know, the, the merciful, oh my, they, they know they're not blessed because they're such an easy target to be taken advantage of in the world, right? I mean, they, they know how bad their lot is. They actually have to put signs on the door of their house warning people that I cannot... I cannot deal with solicitors. If I open that door and I see a little girl selling Girl Scout cookies, I'm going to buy her whole, like, whole wagons full of them. And, and I can't stop myself. And if I open the door and there's a college student selling magazines, I'm going to buy like 10 different copies I don't need. And, and they, they're an easy mark and their family knows it. They're the one you can go to and ask for money and they'll give it to you. They're the ones you can go, I need some help, and they'll be there. Though they're dead tired. They're the people that have run ragged themselves because their merciful hearts cannot say no to anyone. And the peacemakers, nobody likes them because they're not on your side. If you're in the, between two family members that you love and you're trying to be the peacemaker, you know how unblessable peacemakers are. And you know how awful that it is that you just want them to get along and they're fighting with you now too. But it is to these people, now that Jesus has come into their lives, that he says, but you are children of God. You will see God as you're with me. Your unblessable lives have found something. And it's not because they've fallen into this category or they've achieved this status, but in spite of it. Of course, don't expect the world to stand up and applaud that you now, you now are the people who get it. Don't expect the world to assume you're on the honor roll because they will never consider those who are with Jesus to be the people who really get it. In fact, the more your life is taken into the life of Jesus and you become more like Him in His kingdom world, the more you will face the malice, the contempt, the, the ridicule, and the persecution of the world. But this is where the tool of the Beatitudes shines. This is what it's for. Though the world will not bless you and it despises you, Jesus says, nevertheless, rejoice and be glad. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. This is the point and the usefulness of the Beatitudes. You're in. 
everything, you, you, everything that he promises, the kingdom of God, that you are the children of God. You, you receive mercy. You receive the righteousness. You, you receive everything. And it is as sure and as certain as the death and resurrection of Jesus. It is as sure personally and individually for you as your baptism into Jesus. And if none of this has happened for you, you can be as assured even right now as you hear these words, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I forgive you your sins. You're in. As this tool of the, of the Beatitudes is plied upon your soul and used in its proper way, you find that nobody is unblessable. And that you, you are welcomed into this very good and happy life in the kingdom. So as you consider then that your life is caught up into all of this, how, how are you going to take these words and use this tool in such a way that it benefits your life today and tomorrow and forever. Well, I have three suggestions and they're only that. You, you could find many other ways to live these words out, but unless you live them, unless you engage them in an activity, they're just a nice sermon, I hope, that you heard on a Sunday or a Saturday. But if they're going to be a life, you have to put them engaged in the toolbox and in your hand. And so I have a sermon take home and you can go online as well and get this and get it on the table. But maybe you're just a whole new to this and you're just kind of figuring it out. And so I invite you, if you're just a novice, if you're a beginner, to have this be your prayer. Knowing who you are now in the kingdom of God. Jesus, I want to know you better. I want to grow in my love for you. And I want to do what you say. Jesus, lead me in a life where I know you, I love you, and do what you say. And if you're past the beginner stage, you're like, no, I need some meat now. Then take the Sermon on the Mount that the Beatitudes has now introduced. And you know that the door is wide open and you may walk on through. Read Matthew 5 through 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. But be wise in the way you read it. Don't misuse it as if somehow these are more rules and, 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 and a legalism of how now you can be right with God. No, you are wise from the Beatitudes. That this whole sermon is an illustration of a life lived well and happy as Jesus leads and empowers you from the inside out. This is what that life looks like in the Sermon on the Mount. And so your prayer would be, Jesus, transform me into the kind of person who does everything that you have said. And finally, if you're an expert, you've been at this a long time, and you've grown, and you're, you know that you're beyond any beginner or intermediate, then put it into expert mode, and this be your prayer. Jesus, I want to know you better. Lead me in loving you and doing everything that you've said. Yeah, I know it's the same as the, the novice and the beginner. I know you caught me on that one. But we don't go anywhere from there. That, is this not the Christian life? Jesus, I want to know you. I want to love you and do what you say. May the Lord bless you with a very happy life in his kingdom. Amen.